Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm very excited to um, have Louise Mistal with us from Sky Island Alliance. And uh, my name is Sally Hall. I'm the GIS coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And Louise Mistal is on our steering committee for Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And she's also been working on a project uh, funded by <clears throat> Desert LCC and um, other partners, and she will present some of the work that she's doing today. And um, I'm so happy to have everyone. I just want to ask uh, everyone on the call today if you would please um, mute your, your line um, as the presentation is going on, and be careful not to put us on hold <laughs> so we don't hear your hold music. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate your time today. So um, the title of today's talk is Springs in the Sky Island Region, an Inventory Assessment and Management Planning Project. Um, Louise is the ADAPT Program Manager and GIS Specialist at the Sky Island Alliance. She works with land management agencies, uh, federal, tribal, state, and local academic institutions, conservation organizations, and private landowners to ensure conservation-based adaptive land management. And she's the principal architect of a regional climate change adaptation workshop series available to resource managers to advance understanding of climate change impacts on Sky Island ecosystems and to develop on-the-ground adaptation actions that can be implemented. Over the past 11 years, Louise has worked on a variety of research monitoring and conservation projects focused on protecting sensitive species, developing spatial conservation priorities, and reducing <laughs> ecological impacts of roads, implementing climate change adaptation strategies, and inventorying and conserving sensitive water resources. So with that, um, I'll pass the ball over to Louise. Thanks for being here with us this morning. And again, if you could meet, uh, mute your phone lines um, as the presentation is going on, and then we'll answer questions at the very end of the talk today. Louise, thanks for being here. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Louise Mistel. As Sally said, I'm a biologist with uh, Sky Island Alliance, and I'm speaking with you from Tucson, Arizona this morning. Uh, I just want to start by saying thank you to Sally for inviting me to do this talk and giving me the opportunity to share my work with all of you. And you'll see that um, there's a couple other folks on this front slide here that we've been working with on this project. As Sally mentioned, the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative has helped fund a good portion of this work and been a really important partner in developing this project. And then the Spring Stewardship Institute, which is based out of uh, Flagstaff um, and the Museum of Northern Arizona has also been a really important partner. They've been doing work on conserving and documenting springs uh, for, for many years before Sky Island Alliance started this project. So they've been a great resourcing partner. So Sky Island Alliance is, we are an a environmental nonprofit organization. We work to protect native species and to restore their, their habitats in the Sky Island region of the southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico. And as Sally mentioned in, in talking about my work, uh, we, we do a lot of work with agencies, uh, public officials, landowners, scientists. We do a lot of collaborative work to uh, advance conservation initiatives and restoration initiatives. And we also do a lot of work with volunteers. Um, we have a variety of programs where we're collecting information out on public lands and private lands in the region, and uh, volunteers are a really key piece of that, and I'll talk more about that as I talk you through this project that we've been working on. This is an overview of the Sky Island region. So you'll notice it's located in between uh, the Rocky Mountains coming down from the north and the Sierra Madre coming up from Mexico. So um, I think I already mentioned it, but south, southeastern portion of Arizona, southwestern portion of New Mexico, and a good portion of northern Sonora are in the region. And it's called the Sky Island region 
but there are isolated forested mountain ranges that are surrounded by desert and grassland habitat. And so you can see there's a lot of biotic influences in this region. There's um, a lot going on in terms of topography and elevation, lots of niche habitat, species at the edge of their range, uh, high, very high biological diversity. And then in the U.S. portion of the region, which is where we've been doing most of our work so far on springs, uh, the land ownership is, is a patchwork, and so there's lots of um, public lands abutting each other, and um, it creates a complex conservation picture, as you can imagine, and then um, there's climate change interacting with all of this along with everything else we deal with in terms of conservation. So uh, I'm going to start. Um, I, I, I want to talk to you about the Springs Project, and I want to start back with how we came around to developing the project, and then I'll walk you through to uh, show you some of the tools and outcomes that might be of interest to you in your work um, related to Springs. So in terms of thinking about climate change and the Sky Island region, um, about four years ago, Sky Island Alliance decided that we really needed to directly work on the issue in order to um, protect what we would call our conservation investments in the region and think about how we do restoration and protection in a way that's smart for climate. And uh, we developed a, a initiative to improve natural resource management in the face of climate change that was really focused on engaging managers and conservation organizations and scientists uh, and landowners in the region together to develop a, a regional picture of of the most important climate change impacts to focus on vulnerabilities that we all can change by um, implementing management actions, so developing some on-the-ground adaptation strategies that can be undertaken collaboratively, and also just to share climate science and, and have this ongoing discussion about how we're responding to climate in the region. And then Sky Island Alliance, as I mentioned before, does a lot of work with volunteers, and so we were really interested in finding ways that we could plug this core of volunteers that we have. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 volunteers that work with us. Um, many of them have, have different kinds of skills. They're retired scientists, uh, they're avid hikers, that kind of thing. And so we thought that might be a really interesting nexus with some of the, the limited resources that management agencies are facing. And we wanted to see if we could find some projects and uh, adaptation strategies that we could engage volunteers in. So we developed a regional climate adaptation workshop. And we started out by surveying participants. Um, and this really helped inform what sorts of uh, threats in the region we should focus the workshop series on. And aridity and scarcity of water for wildlife and ecosystems was, was one of the top ones. As you can imagine, we're in a pretty arid system here in, in the Sky Island region. Uh, and so we started out with really big pictures, sort of regional climate vulnerability work, uh, starting to explore some big picture adaptation strategies. And springs and water resources factored pretty big in these first workshop discussions. And then we had a lot of repeat workshop participants, and we got more into detail on uh, by ecosystem on vulnerabilities and implementation strategies. And um, I'll talk to you about this a little more, but springs factored really big in that workshop as well. And then finally, um, connectivity, uh, linkages for wildlife, springs, and the issue of the changes in fire regime and how that's affecting the region really came out as key, key issues for us to focus on in our third workshop, which was about really getting down to even more uh, implementable practical adaptation strategies. Uh, so I already mentioned that ar aridity and uh, potential lack of water for wildlife and ecosystems was a big part of, of what managers are focused on in this region. And um, another important piece was that back when we started this work, there was a lot of talk about lack of coordination and information exchange, um, lack of consistency in data collection, and, and that these things are things that can be addressed to try and respond to climate change. So out of these first two workshops, uh, we recognized this need for to address springs as vulnerable ecosystems. And one of the issues that came up from, from the first two workshops with managers was that there's a, a real lack of information on springs in the region. Um, 
there's not any one consistent place where information on springs is being stored so that managers from different jurisdictions can all get to the same information. There's often uh, springs, you know, there might be a place on a map where we think there's a spring there, but nobody's been there in a long time to know if there's really still water there or not. Um, springs are in all different kinds of conditions. Many of them are developed. Um, some of them are not being used for the purpose they were developed for. And so that led us into this idea here of um, springs restoration being a part of this adaptation project. So once we get out and get a better sense of what's going on with springs across the region, then we can start identifying really important sites for restoration. Um, I'm just going to skip this one. So just to give you an idea of who, who was developing these adaptation strategies, we had a real diversity of folks who have been working on the ground in the region for many years, um, lots of knowledge, federal, NGO, state, university folks doing research. We had some private landowners and tribal participants, um, local government participants, and so um, a lot of cross-pollination here. So this is the adaptation strategy that our Springs Inventory and Assessment Project was born out of. Um, you can see here some of the threats that, that folks identified. Um, I've already said this several times, but scarcity of water, um, and then we're looking at increased temperature and aridity. And then the vulnerability that folks identified that we could do, create a strategy for was this lack of data on condition and, um, and status of springs in the region and how they're being used for human, human uses. And then um, the idea was to, to conduct field-based inventories and assessments and see what, what is actually going on at those springs. So how much water is there? What, what is the water quality? Um, what's going on in terms of solar exposure? What's, what, how likely is that spring to, be, to remain a, um, a refugia in terms of thinking about climate change? Um, what's going on there that we could address through some changes in management or restoration activities? And you can see here that we've got a lot of folks who are working with us on this project. Um, it's been a really great project to work on. There's lots of interest, and um, we've been able to play a really important role convening all these folks together and working towards some shared uh, management tools, which is particularly the Springs database, which I'll talk quite a bit about a little later. So just a little more background on Springs in um, Arizona. This is a map from the Springs Stewardship Institute. Uh, Arizona is the second driest state in the nation but has the highest number of springs. And springs are, of course, known to be a keystone ecosystem. They can harbor great biological diversity. Um, they're often really important water sources for wide-ranging animals in addition to uh, harboring endemic species. Um, we, we, they may be climate, important climate refugia when we're thinking about climate change adaptation and scarcity of water. And they're very poorly studied and, and understood. And I already mentioned that many are altered for human use. So, um, so now I'll talk to you a little more about in depth about this Springs Inventory Project that we undertook to, to really implement this adaptation strategy. So we received uh, two, two years of project funding from the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative to get this project going. This is an overview of the, the major components of the project. We started out with um, workshops with managers and experts in the region that are working on and stewarding springs to determine where we would be doing springs inventories. So we all, we all know, we've all agreed that we need to get some more on the ground data and that that's a challenge for managers uh, in a lot of ways because of resources and time. And so Sky Island Alliance is of course looking to uh, see if we can work with volunteers to do some of this work. And so we want to make sure that, but we have limited resources too, so we wanted to make sure that we're starting out somewhere that's really of high priority to a lot of our partners to get some good on the ground data on springs. Um, the regional database for housing and serving springs information has been a real keystone of this project. The Spring Stewardship Institute has done uh, had developed years ago a beautiful access database um, that really did a great job of managing Springs inventory information, but it was housed with them at their office, and we had to actually go there to enter data um, 
and people had to ask them for it if they wanted to see what was going on. And so we worked with them to develop this idea of, of really uh, bringing that database online in a way that um, <coughs> managers from different jurisdictions and people from across the broad area, this is actually an international database, but we were focused on the Sky Island region, could see what's going on at that bigger picture level and also can see the, you know, work their protocols into this database uh, set up so that we're all starting to share data in a compatible way. Um, a big part of this project also was doing the actual inventories. That was a really fun part of this project. And then we took that information to do uh, some management planning around springs, feeding it into that third workshop on climate change adaptation specifically for springs. and starting to really work on this question of high priority springs for conservation <coughs> and restoration. So when we started out prioritizing the areas, um, we, we looked at a number of factors. Uh, we worked very closely with, with the managers, as I said, to get their input on this. And um, one of the key things that we, um, as we went through this prioritization, was there, the area we ended up choosing, the Cienega Creek, a uh, hydrogeologic area, had a lot of conservation investments in it already. There was, there was a big diversity of land ownership in that area, a big diversity of elevation, and um, yeah. that one really rose to the top. <coughs> so this is the, the, a, a bigger look at the project region here in southeastern Arizona. Um, we decided to use we started out using groundwater subbasins as uh, the, the sort of study area delineation to decide where to work. And um, this is just a slide to show you that before we even ah. got to the point of deciding where we were going to do work on the ground, we had a data problem. So uh, the Spring Stewardship Institute has done a lot of work to um, reconcile a lot of different data sets on springs and remove duplicates and add um, springs from USGS topos that are missing and that kind of thing in other areas of the country, but hadn't yet done it in this region where we were wanting to be, to be doing field work. And so we spent quite a bit of time at the outset working with them and some volunteers at the USGS to um, reconcile all this data so that we, have, we don't have a bunch of duplicates and um, missing springs and that kind of thing, and that was really important in terms of deciding to work on the ground because we do a, uh, a clustered randomized sample. So we want to make sure we're clustering and randomizing with all the springs that we know to be out there. Hey, Louise, can we pause yeah. for a moment? Um, I would just want to ask, remind folks to put your phones on mute if you're not the presenter or later asking a question, okay? Thanks and so you much. can also press star six, and that'll mute your your phone. Oh, great! So if everyone would press star six, that would be great. <laughs> all right. Um, so once we once we got the data all cleaned up, um, we were able to feed that into the randomization process. This is just a look at uh, how many duplicate springs there were between these. The data set we started with from the Spring Stewardship Institute and then data we got from the USGS and the Coronado National Forest, Pima County. Um, but you can see there's a number of new springs uh, coming from these data sets and quite a bit of overlap, so a lot of data cleaning. So um, I was just going to show you some, some maps that we used with the managers in the process of prioritizing where we were going to do the work. Um, as I said, we, we gave them the option of surface watersheds or groundwater subbasins, and we ended up uh, collectively deciding to go with the groundwater subbasins. And we put together information to show them um, what sort of elevational distribution was within a potential study area, what the ownership was, um, what management units that might be of interest are in that area, the size of the area, and the number of springs. And so you can just see that they, that some, some of these um, potential study areas have really different elevational distribution. Um, some of them have far more springs than others. Um, so a lot of diversity going on in this in this region. Uh, Cienega Creek is the one we settled on. Um, as I mentioned, it was a, a good diversity of ownership, some very important conservation areas. 
And another issue for us working with volunteers was access. So a lot of public land that was relatively accessible working out of Tucson. So um, the regional database, I talked a little bit about this, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually show you later on uh, some screenshots of what that looks like and, and how you can use that. Um, I'll just say here that we, we did work with that same partner group of managers to really ensure that we were bringing it online in a way that would be useful to them and uh, accessible to them. And part of the goal here, too, was to incorporate existing spatial data. So the inventories and assessments on the ground to develop new information. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I woke up with a sore throat here in Tucson, and I'm trying to work it out with cough drops. <coughs> um, we worked with the Spring Stewardship Institute to uh, use protocols that they have developed over many years to really um, uh, ecologically assess springs and uh, collect information on them. And we uh, modified those a little bit to make them suitable for working with volunteers. And then we formally <coughs> trained volunteers <coughs> and agency personnel in these protocols. So here's a look at the data that we gathered at spring sites, including um, basic georeferencing information, <coughs> site maps uh, to, to capture <coughs> microhabitats, <coughs> geomorphological information, <coughs> photographs. I'm really sorry. I'm having a little coughing fit here. If you could excuse me for one second. No worries, Louise. Let's pause for a moment, take a drink of water, see if that helps. All right. <clears throat> I'll try to persevere here. Um, so taking photographs at sites, collecting information on species present, so plants and animals, um, as I mentioned before, how much water is there and water quality. Um, and so this is a spring site where we're doing a survey with a volunteer. And I just put these, this site and this site in here to show you that there's a lot of diversity in springs in the area. This is a beautiful site <clears throat> with lots of water. And this site is clearly um, not had water there in a long time. And so you can see that it's really good to have this information <clears throat> in terms of understanding where to direct management and restoration resources. And part of the on-the-ground work we were doing at Springs is this ecosystem uh, assessment for condition and value versus risk. And so this was a qualitative effort to understand what's going on at the site in terms of geomorphology, habitat, biology, human influences. And this was really um, a great tool for us to start to understand what condition sites are in, what are the risks at the sites, and identify um, priorities, again, for, for potential restoration. So you want to pick sites where condition might be impaired, but you have some hope of um, restoring some of that condition. And um, so the, the, the ecosystem assessment is, is really a key piece of the prioritization piece. This is a, a look at the Sienega Creek study area and the springs that we surveyed. And you can see um, we ended up surveying, I think it was 61 springs out of 113. Um, some of them were part of the random sample. We got some extra springs in there during the field work. Um, and um, I just wanted to show you some of the, the photos from the field work. So you can see that some springs are completely developed. Uh, this is that dry spring again. Uh, some of them are developed, but the infrastructure is not really working properly. Some of them are in really great shape, um, or they haven't been developed. Um, lots of diversity in terms of <coughs> some springs being in channels. Um, other springs are hill slope type springs, so out away from Rio Green channels. Um, this was a really sad one. <laughs> All that's left is this pipe there. Uh, this was a beautiful one that's in a cattle exclosure that's been uh, studied for a long time. Some of them are heavily impacted by mines and other pollution. 
Um, so you can just see that there's a, a lot of different kinds of springs and habitats. So after doing our assessments on the 61 springs in the area, this is a, a, a quick look at some of the inventory results. The average, average area of spring habitat was 464 meters squared. So these are pretty small habitats that are really important. Um, the average elevation of springs we looked at was uh, 1584 meters, and the average flow was 0.14 liters. So a lot of these sites, if they have water, it's pretty small amounts of water, although sometimes it's supporting a lot of really good habitat in terms of um, spring, spring microhabitat. And this is a look at the types of springs in the region. Uh, you can see the big blue area is Rio Crean. Rio Crean springs are springs that emerge in a channel, so um, often springs that are contributing to some perennial water in a creek bed, those kinds of springs. Uh, Gila Crean springs and Hill Slope springs were the next most common two types of springs. The Gila Crean are the wet meadow type of springs, and the Hill Slope are ones that just emerge um, basically out of a hill slope, not necessarily into any kind of surrounding uh, channel, but they sometimes they do emerge into a channel. And these, uh, this is a look at the human impacts on springs from our, our ecological assessment protocol. Um, you can see here some of the types of um, metrics we're looking at. What's the adjacent land condition? Um, is recreation impacting the spring? What about herbivory, um, construction? and so on, and um, the, this chart here, the higher number means it's in better condition. So the, main, the two main impacts on springs in the, in the region were flow regulation and herbivory. Um, invasive species are definitely a big issue at these spring sites, which is probably not news to anybody. Um, some sites are impacted by roads and trails. We went to a site where there's actually a road built right through the spring. Um, sometimes there's trails where, where rec people hiking and that kind of thing are trying to get to the spring and the trail goes right through the microhabitat of the spring. So just to recap on this, this inventory project, um, and then I'll delve into the details of the database. Um, we started out with the workshops with managers and selected the Sienega Creek study area. Uh, we brought the Springs Inventory Database online, working with the Springs Stewardship Institute to create a management tool to store this kind of information and um, inform decisions around springs protection and restoration. Um, <coughs> we developed inventory and assessment protocols for volunteers, and we've been working with managers in the region with those as well surveyed the 61 springs. We actually interestingly located 11 springs that in hiking around that were not previously mapped and were not part of our, our initial um, data set for springs to survey. So that was very interesting. And then we worked with this the same manager uh, group to identify priority springs for protection and restoration. Um, so I'll say a word about restoration. Um, this work we've been doing with the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative really set us up to be able to get some other other funding from the Wildlife Conservation Society Climate Change Adaptation Fund to help us actually do some springs restoration. So we had already been doing surveys. Um, lots of sites were popping up that needed some help in terms of removing invasive species or removing some non-functioning infrastructure or that kind of thing. And so we were able to use that information and uh, help prioritize some restoration sites and um, work on uh, doing some restoration of, of ecological functioning and removal of invasive species this uh, spring here. Um, it doesn't look like much, oops, but it um, was a great spot to put in some frog, some infrastructure to help frogs get in and out of the water source for Chiricahua leopard frog recovery. So those kinds of activities we were able to undertake. And um, coming out of that work, uh, something we're working on now that I'll just mention is, um, in addition to discovering that there's not a lot of on-the-ground data in this region on what's happening at Springs, there's not a lot of um, published science and um, resources to inform restoration at Springs. So as we went through the restoration side of the project, um, we realized that there was really this need in Arizona and um, in these arid spring systems to 
um, develop more guidance around what sorts of things to consider in restoration, um, how to incorporate this monitoring and inventory information into that. And so um, that's something we're working on now that we're convening workshops on. So now I will uh, move into talking about some of the products from this work and the resources available to managers. So the regional database, um, it can be accessed at this, at this website here, springsdata.org. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Spring Stewardship Institute had really, um, when we started doing this work, they had really already done an incredible amount of work to build a very functional and beautiful access database. And they had actually been uh, um, working on this issue of trying to figure out how to make it more accessible. And so we came along with this, with some support from the um, Landscape Conservation Cooperative and the same idea. And so we were able to work with them to do the programming and all of that to bring this database online. And we're really excited about this. It's a really beautiful product and I'm hoping you can go check it out and um, get set up using it. So. First of all, uh, you, you do have to create an account. And um, a lot of thought went into data privacy and safety issues. Um, you can imagine there might be sensitive species information that wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't want everybody to just be able to see. Um, different tribes are, can be very um, sensitive about not wanting certain information shared with other tribes or other agencies. Um, the same, same with any agency or conservation group or private landowner. Um, so there were a lot of issues around figuring out how to manage the, the privacy and safety of the data. And it starts with um, folks having an, a user account. Um, and this is administered by Jerry Ledbetter at the Spring Stewardship Institute. So you can create an account and a profile here. Um, and uh, one of the things around managing data privacy is to, when you create an account, uh, we want to know what areas of interest you're working in spatially. So um, for, for me, I'm in the Sky Island project. Um, um, so that's a starting place for determining what sorts of information you can have access to. And then um, what sorts of, uh, what land you, if you're with a federal agency or state agency, what land you're managing and have uh, stewardship over. Um, and then, so that we, we, you'll have, you have to work with Jerry to get the permissions to see different things. But certainly um, anybody that's, you know, if BLM is managing uh, BLM land in, Sky, in the Sky Island region, they, they can get access to, to um, the BLM projects in that area. And so then this is organized around um, sites and surveys. Um, and you can search for springs by a name, um, or you can very handily search for springs that you, that you want to enter data on uh, spatially. So there's this pop-up Google map that gives you the option to select an area to search for springs. And the uh, database will return you a list of all the springs that are in this database. So Jerry's uh, data, the, the way this was set up here with, with um, Jerry's previous work on the access database, um, she's also a wonderful GIS specialist. So she did a lot of work to tie the front end access database back to her geo database where she's storing all of the springs data spatially and ensuring that there aren't duplicates and that kind of thing. And so um, this this online version is tied in the same kind of way. So if you're adding, if you end up looking for a spring that you surveyed and it's not there and you add a record uh, through here and the back end, it's going to get added into the spatial data as well, which is really great to keep that database and spatial data closely linked. Um, once you get the list of springs that it, from your search, you can also view them in a map. So everything's very, um, visually, uh, spatially linked from the database to map. So this is a, a look at what you see once you get into a spring. This is uh, Oak Spring in Cochise County, southern Arizona. Um, and so there's general information here. Uh, there's descriptions, um, 
polygons are related to the uh, microhabitat mapping information that I said we were doing. Georeferencing is just making sure once you're out on the ground, you know, we're, we were taking GPS measurements, so making sure that the uh, coordinates that are in the geodatabase and in this database match what you actually found out on the ground. Uh, geomorphology is again about those different types of springs and um, and so you can see there's a lot of information here. And then surveys uh, here on the, in this right here, are how you keep track of um, new, new survey information. So all of this general upfront information is associated with a site and, and stays the same. Um, but then you go, if you go and survey a site, um, this is a look at the survey information. This is where you can have multiple surveys per site if you're going back um, multiple times and get more detailed information on what was the flow at that time, you know, what was the water quality, what animals were there, um, what's going on in terms of the, the ecological assessment protocol, so has anything changed in terms of impact, and so forth. Uh, so uh, part of the part of what goes into the database too are are photos from the site, so you can get an idea visually of what's going on there, and the, and these sketch maps that are actually drawn to scale to document microhabitats and area. And so um, that's just a really cursory look at the database to give you a tickler. But um, we will be doing uh, with in cooperation with Jerry. Uh, some tr some trainings for managers. We had a webinar earlier this year. We'll have a couple more webinars, and then we'll actually be doing some in-person, on-computer training for use of the database. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I'm sure uh, we'll, we will advertise it through the Desert LCC. Um, so the, the next tool that I want to talk to you about was an interactive map that um, Jerry helped us create so that you can get to spring survey information through a different interface. Uh, this isn't the interactive map, but this is a, a beautiful, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is interactive. So um, Jerry, uh, Jerry and Larry with the Spring Stewardship Institute have also received, recently received funding from the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative to deal with that uh, data issue that I talked about before and to really accurately map springs across the region. And so this is a, a slide from one of their presentations updating folks on how that project's going. Um, and so this is a look at the interactive map that's specifically for the Sky Island region where we've been working. And so um, you can see you're in a, in a basic online map interface, and then you can click on a spring that you're interested in, and you get all this information that's coming directly from the, from the spring's inventory database and survey information. So, um, and then you can actually can see this hyperlink here with more info. So you can click on that and go into uh, get a PDF of the survey report. So this is all that great information around solar exposure, georeferencing, species, photos that you know we just looked at in the inventory um, database. And so that was really all I had for you guys. So I would like to open it up for questions and say thank you for uh, joining us. And thanks again to Sally for having me. Thank you so much, Louise. That was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. And in the chat of the WebEx, I put a link to the final report that you gave us. And also, oh, there's a link to map services in there. And um, also, the springsdata.org link if you check the chat window there. Does anyone have any questions? If you've, mu if you've muted your phone using star six, you can unmute it, um, pressing star six as well. So uh, we'll take questions now. You can also type the questions into the um, chat window. Uh, yes, hello. Hello. This is Jean Marie Haney of the Nature Conservancy, and I did uh, type a question in the chat window. And it's got to do with uh, this is a really great, really great work. So glad it's been done. And I'm wondering about what are the opportunities or chances of expanding it statewide. Mm -hmm. Well, so um, so 
the Spring Stewardship Institute is actually doing a lot of this work in northern Arizona um, on Forest Service land and tribal land. And so that part of the state is actually getting pretty well covered by their efforts. Um, we, uh, after doing this initial groundwater subbasin, we now have another uh, two years of funding from the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative and are working in the Santa Cruz area now, and we're hoping to keep finding ways to fund that work to keep uh, expanding it in southern Arizona where we're working. Um, and, you know, we uh, it's been really exciting to be able to get the level of information we've been able to get with this volunteer model that really um, makes it a far less expensive. So, um, so I think there's great possibility for expanding it further, and some of that's definitely already happening. Thanks for your question. Any more questions? Uh, will the will the presentation be um, available somewhere in the links? Because I actually had to leave my computer, and so I don't have the links. Yes, yes, it'll be available on our YouTube channel, um, and also I'll be sending out a PDF of the slides to the registered participants. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for asking. Well, I had one more question. <laughs> okay, great. There's the Arizona Water Atlas, um, that the Department of Water Resources put together. They they uh, they worked for a couple of years uh, on on a spring um, on a spring database, more or less. And I was wondering if that was utilized. And um, just you know, it it still seems like. It wasn't completely complete. So, as of right now, like, where's the best place to go to get spring data? Is it is it this um, database that you were demoing, or um, or is this AZ Water Atlas database, or what do you think? So we worked with uh, Kelly Moss um, when we uh, all through this project, but she she was. Uh, one of the principal people on d doing that Arizona Water Atlas work, and she sh shared Springs data they had with us, and so that all went into this database um, when we went through the, the um, process of pulling everything together and then removing duplicates. And so um, we've really, the, between us and the Spring Stewardship Institute, a lot of work has been done to, um, you know, pull in as all the data sources that we could find and are aware of, and then uh, remove duplicates and clean it up so it's one master data source. So I would really say the, that this data source right now is, is the best one in this area, in southern Arizona, and really in northern Arizona, too, because the Spring Stewardship Institute's been working up there quite a bit for a long time. Uh, great. So the database covers more than the Sky Island region. Yes, yes. The database is in, is actually international. There's Springs information up in Canada. There's um, we've just started do, adding some information from Mexico. Um, yeah, it covers you know uh, the whole. Well, it's international, but um, there's just not necessarily survey data in all those places. And we've been Jerry's been focusing where she works on cleaning data based on. Um, you know priorities and where they're working, and now with this, with the work they're doing for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative, that whole LCC portion of the U.S. will will be all cleaned up and beautiful and ready for use, which will be wonderful. Hi, Louise. This is Amy. Thanks so much for a great webinar. I'm so sorry um, that you're not feeling well this morning. Thanks for sticking it through. <laughs> Thinking through it, um, we uh, related to that last comment. We were talking to some folks at USGS with the National Hydrography Data Set yesterday about um, 
um, looking at, you know, what is the authoritative data for the nation in terms of uh, surface waters of the U.S. and USGS hosts that and they work with a variety of partners in each state uh, to keep it updated. And we were talking about how it would be great to find a way to make sure that they can use this information from this project as well to update that national data set. Is that something that you all have thought about at all or would be interested in? Yes, I think we would definitely be interested in that. Um, yeah, and I, um, it would be great to talk with uh, Jerry Ledbetter and Larry Stevens about that as well. Jerry, yeah. Jerry is still really the owner of the bigger data set. I mean, the, the Stewardship Institute is. Um, but yeah, I'm sure. I mean, their goal is to really get good data out to people to use. So I think that would be great. Thanks. Hi, this is Drew Decker with USGS. Um, yeah, I work with a lot with the NHC data set. I do agree. It would be interesting to, to learn more about your database, which is a, a great resource. And matter of fact, I saw an email from Carol Ostergren, who's the um, liaison up in uh, Northern California, Nevada, commenting on how valuable this may be. So it might be good for us to talk a little bit about this in the future and see how the data may be able to be uh, worked into the NHD. This is, again, this is a great resource to, to add into there. So we'll follow up on that. Yeah, Louise, I think you um, and your colleagues have uh, really developed an amazing model to follow here, both on the um, mapping and um, side of it, but also just the inventories and the conservation work, the citizen science and engaging volunteers. It's really just an amazing project. Um, and uh, we're, we're really happy to be able to help you tell the story of it and, and to look at how we can collaborate on growing it to um, a larger area and maybe other parts of the Desert LCC. So um, congratulations and, and kudos. Thank you. It looks like we've got a few uh, questions here in the chat box. Um, let me see. Uh, the first one is, will the remainder of Arizona Springs be added to the map service over time? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, that bigger LCC map that you, that I briefly showed you that uh, Jerry and Larry are working directly on um, should be, I'm guessing that that's going to be coming out finalized next, sometime late next year. So, yep. And then springs in non tribal areas are available now. Um, you just got have to register, as I showed, and um, you can work out with Jerry about access to different data. I mean, basically, as long as, you know, people who are putting data into the database, if the data is sensitive, that has to be flagged when it goes in. And there are certain things in there that we already know to be sensitive, but anything that's not um, flagged as sensitive by them, the people who are entering the data is should be available for you to get to. Um, the next question we have is, um, let's see. Uh, how long did it take to complete the inventory? So we did field work over the course of about a year and a half to get to those 61 springs. Um, and we used a model of, we, Sky Island Alliance has long used a model of conducting volunteer field weekends. So we go out somewhere on a Friday, we camp, we do various kinds of work over the weekend, and then um, come back. And so we used that model for a lot of these spring assessments where we would go to a, a cluster of springs and spend the weekend with volunteers and uh, collect, collect as much data as we could. I, I think we kind of ranged between something like six and 11 springs per weekend. And then we, you know, had to capture a lot of outlying springs that didn't work with that model. But um, so a year and a half um, of Definitely, you know, a sporad I would say sporadic field work to get all the inventories done. Does anyone else have any more questions? Well, thanks again, Louise, for your um, wonderful talk today and your amazing work. Um, and I know I will definitely be using this data in my work and 
Thank you for everyone who attended the call today. Again, this will be posted on the Desert LCC YouTube channel in the next uh, couple of weeks. So uh, go ahead and subscribe to that, and you'll be notified when we post it. And thanks, Louise. Yeah, thank you again for having me and giving me the opportunity to share this work. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, and the pleasure is all ours. <laughs> Have a wonderful day.